Welcome to the Cedar Fort Come Follow Me Made Easier podcast. I'm your host, Linda Cherry. Today we have the opportunity to discuss Exodus 1 through 6 with our teacher, Lori Denning. Thanks, Linda. Thank you for the great introduction. That's right. This week we are headed into Exodus. And again, we are still in the Old Testament, which is my very favorite. So let's jump in. Today, as we're headed into a new book, I want to take just a couple of minutes to talk about the structure and what's going on. And then we're actually going to just jump right in. So join me. First, uh, the thing to remember when we jump into these stories is we're mid-story. So while we think of Genesis and Exodus being different books, and even apart from Moses and Abraham and the Pearl of Great Price, they're really part of one big story, the story of the Pentateuch or the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, that really book of Moses kind of section. And so when we hit Exodus, we're just in the second part. So I threw up a little picture in the background, I don't know if you can see it, but uh, of Star Wars. It reminds us that we are kind of in like Star Wars Episode Six or Star Wars Episode Four, or and we're kind of jumping in in the middle of the story. And so when we do that, it's important that we remember a little bit what's going on. Now we've just done that, so I'm not going to repeat all that. But just to recall, we're going to remember things like the creation, the fall, the covenant, and how this is God's story of working with His children. Because we're going to see the same things happen again here, and yet and hundreds of years later with different people. So the first thing to remember as part of that is that again, part of a big story. The second is the structure of Exodus itself. The structure of Exodus, much like the structure of Genesis, it comes in two parts. Now, these two parts are much more evenly uh, separated, unlike last time. Um, in Genesis was really lopsided on the end, but this one's almost right in the middle. There are 40 chapters in the book of Exodus and about halfway, about 19, we have this first half. And the first half is the story of Pharaoh and the plagues and the Passover and the, uh, the Exodus itself where we get the name of the book and then it chapter 19 and 20 we see this covenant so it's kind of this pivotal point everything is driving to this pivotal point and it isn't the crossing of the sea and it isn't the freeing of the the slaves it's this covenant when they actually go back and meet with God in 19 and 20 and then the second half is really a set of building instructions for the first uh, temple the tabernacle in that dispensation so First half, all of the Pharaoh story. Middle is this section of the covenant and meeting God and reading his presence. And then the second half is really the belly instructions. So that's kind of the structure. Today, we're going to go through a first part of that first half, the Pharaoh story. Now, when it sets off in Exodus chapter one, uh, let's look at a verse there. And it's you're, you're, you're going to be tempted. You're going to be tempted to skip this first few verses because it's kind of long. So it goes like this. Um, chapter 1, Exodus, verse 1. Now these are the names of the children of Israel, which came into Egypt. Every man in his household came with Jacob, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, Dan, and Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. And all the souls that came out of the loins of Jacob were 70 souls, for Joseph was in Egypt already. And Joseph died, and all his brethren, and all that generation. And then this is where we kind of take the turn. And the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly and multiplied and waxed exceedingly mighty, and the land was filled with them. So the first thing, I know you're going to say, this, I'm tempted to leave this first one because it's like, yeah, yeah. But remember, they're setting in our minds what's already come before, that this is the story of how they got, how did the Israelites get to Egypt? Well, we're going to remember the 12 tribes, and it literally lists them. Now, each, Joseph was already there, so it lists all the other brothers. And then it says, yeah, they, but it's way later than that. So Joseph had died, all of these guys had died, and, and this is years and years and generations have passed. And something really great has happened. It's the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant, and that's that verse 7. They were fruitful and increased abundantly and multiplied and waxed exceedingly mighty and the land was filled with them. Let me phrase that again and I'm going to rephrase the, the order of the words. They were full, fruitful and multiplied and increased abundantly. What does that remind us of? Yeah, it should jump out that that is the creation story. The 
blessing of God is given to them. And so we're saying, hey, these people have received that blessing and they're doing exactly what they were commanded to do and exactly what the Lord is blessing them to do in this uh, covenant promise as they're going to um, uh, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And there they are doing it. And so we're like, oh, that is just like what was happening in Genesis. And yet here we see this continuation of that covenant, right? The people have grown the the posterity and, and things are there. And so you're like, okay, I get it. We're in a new generation hundreds of years later, and yet they're still being blessed by God. And then the story takes a bit of a pivot. And that's when we're introduced to our next character, and that is Pharaoh. So the Pharaoh is king. Um, it says a new king who didn't know Joseph. Again, this is hundreds of years later. Some say 400. I've read a few that say 273 in a very convoluted counting method. But either way, it's hundreds of years and generations and generations later. So they didn't know Joseph and things have really changed. And this new king named Pharaoh is the big bad guy of the series. Now, we've met some big bad guys, right? We have met, of course, Satan and he aside in people terms. Um, we've met people like Cain, pretty bad guy. We've met people like Lamech, who killed a kid just because it made him mad. Um, we meet uh, the whole generations of, of Noah, and then we read all those kind of creepy stories with Lot and the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. And so you think, boy, these are some pretty bad folks. And yet this guy, Pharaoh, is worse than all of them. He's the worst one we have met so far. In fact, he's so bad, he doesn't have a name. Now, we know enough about Egyptology to know that they are given names, and most of them are things like um, Ramesses, right, uh, the, uh, which means the son of Ra, the god Ra. Now, I'm not an Egyptologist, so if I'm saying that right, sorry about that. But excuse me, or like uh, King Tut, right? So you, you, you've heard these names, and so we know that these pharaohs have names. They're not just called pharaoh. And yet, isn't that interesting that it doesn't pin it down? And I think that it's trying to tell us that not only is this a story in time with Moses and the Israelites, but it is also teaching us that this is a story about tyranny and evil people. And we're going to see how the story is in those two halves about being released from not only slavery and physical bondage, things like death and slavery, but we're also going to see a spiritual release. So you're going to see kind of the salvation of Christ come in the story of Moses. You're going to see how Jesus saves us from death and hell or and gives us um, salvation and exaltation. And here you're going to see the same thing. They're going to be released physically from bondage and spiritually from bondage and separation. So you're going to see that. And Pharaoh has a big role. He's the big bad guy. And I think that's why he doesn't have a name, because in some ways we should be paralleling this story with all of the stories of a big bad, all of the stories of an evil king and tyranny. Um, so keep that in mind, that he is definitely the worst we have met so far. And here's why we know that. The first thing he says is, wow, these Israelites, they have really uh, taken over. They're everywhere. And so he kind of comes up with a plan. And his first plan is to, uh, he says, they're, they're mightier than us. And if we're ever in a war, they, they might uh, turn against us. So he first says slavery, he puts them under burden. So he says, we'll just drive them into submission and maybe they will quit multiplying and, and being so prosperous that way with families. And so he puts them under burdens and slavery first. And that doesn't work. The Lord continues to bless them and their families. And so then he just does a quiet genocide. And this is where we go, wow, truly evil guy. He's like, you know, when he calls in a couple of the midwives and uh, they say, uh, hey, when, when you have a baby boy, let's throw him to the Nile. And remember, the Nile is a god, right? It's not only the water of the river and all of uh, the... Uh, how they get life through their crops and everything, but it's also literally a god of Egypt. And so they're like, we'll throw it to our god. We'll throw these baby boys in the river. So truly evil guy. So first slavery um, and servitude and now a quiet genocide. I want to point out that it names two of the midwives who refuse to do this. And you're going to see this story over and over again, how it's both men and women who are partaking in this salvation and part of this redemption. They serve as deliverers. And here are the first two, these two midwives that refuse to kill the babies when they come along. So, um, so you're going to see where people have a choice to be a deliverer. People have a choice to help the Lord in his work. Um, and so you see that here. In the next chapter, you're going to meet uh, three more women. 
uh, who help and serve in deliverance. So while this is a story of Moses and his deliverance and the Lord and his deliverance, we're going to see the role of men and women. So I just want to point that out. So anyway, so we're meeting Pharaoh. We set the stage, truly evil. The people have multiplied and been blessed, and yet now they are in slavery um, and they are also being killed. So that is a little bit of chapter one. Let's move on to chapter two. All right. Our story now has been set with Pharaoh, and now we learn about Moses, and it tells us a story about his parents. And it says very quickly, there was um, a man from the house of Levi, and he got married to a woman from the house of Levi, and they had a son. And then it said something interesting in verse two. It says, when she saw that he was a goodly child. Um, this phrase would be like, of course they're a goodly child. What child isn't cute and awesome, and you wouldn't want to uh, throw them into the Nile. But this term also seems to, t seems to tell us something um, that scholars believe is saying there's something special about him. And they noticed something divine, some kind of, uh, not that he was divine, but something blessed. He was something uh, that the divine had blessed. So there was something special about him. So it says he was goodly. Um, that's kind of that idea is that he was uh, blessed of God. So they noticed that. And so she comes up with this audacious plan. Clearly, uh, the father does as well. But here it mentions the mom, uh, which we learn is Yochabed as her name later. Uh, and she hides him for three months. Now, this has got to be a pretty bold plan. I mean, um, if uh, Amram, the dad, uh, we meet him in a second, but if he goes out and has to work again as a slave, she is staying home and caring for this child. And uh, he was so little at the point that they could probably hide him. But once he gets old enough, um, where he's not sleeping all day, and he's starting to uh, become visible, <laughs> she can't hide him anymore. And so at that point, at three months, they realize, what are we going to do now? Uh, so they come up with this great and audacious plan. And so they say, let's put him in a little basket. Now the word that she uses is an ark, right? It's the literal word ark. And we should be kind of tying these key ideas in that in this story of Moses, there's a story of an ark um, that becomes, that is put on water and becomes the source of salvation for an entire people, much like the Ark of Noah. And that's exactly right. It's the same word um, where the Ark, where Noah and all the animals are put in there and they save an entire generation. And then we also think of the Ark of the Covenants and some of those. So just, just want to point out that sometimes you'll see it like in the musical or in the movies where it's like, hey, it's a basket. He's placed in a basket. Um, but that word is great, but you miss the idea that he's placed in an Ark. He's placed in an ark. Um, so she takes the ark, she uh, waterproofs it, and puts the baby Moses in there, and off he goes. Now, at this point, we don't know his name, so spoiler alert, I already told you his name. But she puts him in the basket and sends her older daughter, um, uh, which we is, also goes unnamed at this point. We learn about her later. This is going to be Miriam, who's probably around seven or ten, if I remember right. It, it does tell us. And then they have an older brother, Aaron, whom we're going to meet. So we're going to meet these three siblings and spend a lot of time with them through the next four books of the Bible. But at this point, M baby Moses is the youngest. Uh, he's going unnamed at this point, and he's put into this little basket, uh, this little ark, and he's set into the river. Now here is where we meet the next, we've met the next two of our deliverers, the next two of our saviors, uh, people saviors, little less, um, in the story. We've met the mother. So you'll notice that again, the mother serves as someone that's going to serve for redemption and salvation. She's going to great lengths to hide him, but also to save him and put him in this great plan of putting him in the ark, which is just crazy. And then we meet the sister who's going to uh, watch the ark as it goes down the River Nile and uh, protect it. So we've already been introduced to the two midwives who are serving as deliverers and saviors. And then we're going to meet these next few women, the um, the sister and the mother who are also helping. So this is, a, this is the whole family is involved and uh, lots of roles for all of us to emulate in a way, not Literally, you're probably not going to be at the Nile, but but I think it's cool that we can see um, uh, sometimes that it's all these roles. It's it's easy sometimes to pick on the guys in the stories because they always have all the roles. But I just want to point out in this story, there are a lot of uh, men and women, and, uh, and it's a really great way to emulate uh, the Savior in our lives is that we can also serve to be upright and follow our covenants, and in this way, save. You never know, right? Kind of cool. So sister is there, 
and then uh, they put the uh, they put the baby in the basket in the ark and off he goes and uh, the sister Miriam is guarding again unnamed now we'll talk about that in a second so it goes off if it, it goes down the river and there is Pharaoh's daughter so here's yet another woman that's going to serve as a kind of redeemer a saver savior in the story and that's Pharaoh's daughter so she's out there washing in the river now the river was again a god it was seemed to be sacred so she's probably you know in the house up above um we don't know how many daughters this pharaoh has but could be a lot actually and comes down and um and so she's out there uh in the reeds enough that she can um, somehow notices the little ark now it, in a minute it says that he's crying so it could have been that maybe she heard him crying and so she sends her maid out and says there's there's a basket out there. there's an ark out there go get it so uh, they wade out through their rushes and you can feel the drama is like oh they're gonna find him and what are they gonna do and they bring it and they open it and they recognize the baby is crying and she realizes that he's hebrew child um not an egyptian so either um the way he's dressed if he has a certain Certain clothing, um, perhaps his coloring. Uh, he could be uh, even circumcised at this point. And so they're like, hey, this is uh, not an Egyptian baby. This is a Hebrew baby um, that's out here in this. And yet, despite that, she loves him. And so she takes him into her household and adopts him as her son. But he's crying. And so he needs to eat. So there's a Hebrew girl just standing there on the riverbank. And he says, well, what, what should we do? And she goes, well, I I uh, happen to know a woman. Should I go get a nurse uh, that could do it? Just just happen to know one. Um, of course, that's Moses's mother. And uh, Miriam, thinking quick-witted and bold, uh, speaking Egyptian even, uh, goes up to the uh, princess and saves Moses's life. Not only does she protect him in the little ark, but she is quick-witted and saves his life and allows for the mother, uh, Yochebed, to be in his life and, and help raise him. So a really miraculous story. And that's what we should first remember, that sometimes the names aren't in these stories yet because it should highlight the main character of the story. And that's the Lord, the hand of the Lord in these stories. So it isn't just that it's Miriam and Yochebed and the princess. It's that the Lord is making this happen. Now, at this point, we are introduced to uh, Moses as his first name and says, well, I, after I draw him out, the princess says, I will name him Moses. And it says that's because his name meant to draw out. Um, in Hebrew, it's a little bit of a stretch that his name is uh, to be drawn out of water. It's kind of cool. It makes sense. Uh, kind of. And then, uh, but we also think that some scholars do think that his name is actually an Egyptian name. And so I alluded to the structure there where you see Moses means son of. Um, and so the name of the god might be at the first part. So like Ra Masis um, is the son of Ra, the sun god, Ra, sun god, right? So Ramesses, you probably heard that one, or Tutmosis, uh, King Tut, uh, the son of Toth or Toth. Again, I'm not an Egyptologist, so I'm sure I'm saying that wrong. But um, you'll see where he probably had, he might have had an, an Egyptian name, and then they dropped the name of the god. So he's just Moses, um, and that's a little bit more Hebrew anyway. So kind of cool. So it's the first time we see his name to be drawn out, um, or son. So we see that this name is uh, very indicative of both of his roots, being Hebrew and perhaps raised by the Egyptians. Now he's raised in the household of the Egyptians, and this is where the story takes a turn. Um, there's a big gap in his life. So for the next, say, 40 years, it says, um, his life is broken into three batches of 40. So it's 40, 40, 40, 120, maybe. But these big chunks. So this first time you see this introduction to him, and then there's a gap. Now, that's really common in ancient stories about people is that their biography doesn't start until the important things of their life start. So sometimes there's a birth narrative or something just like this, and then there's this big gap. And so that's pretty normal. In fact, um, not only is it normal here, but you're going to see it in the story of Jesus himself, right? You see his birth and maybe an instance at the temple, but most of his childhood is blank because it isn't until those events of their life that become that we kind of pick up the biography or pick up the story of their lives. So we see that in Moses, we see that in Jesus, and we actually see it from a lot of other people at the same time. So some weird literary history for you. Okay, so now Moses is named, he's growing up as an Egyptian. 
When I think of this story, um, I usually think of the uh, Ten Commandments, the Cecil B. DeMille movie with Charlton Heston, and, and some of you might have seen that. I also really like the musical Prince of Egypt. And in those, both of them, it's like he's surprised that he's, he's uh, Hebrew. He's like, what? Uh, and that's leading you astray. Here in the scriptures, we actually see that he knew uh, that he was Hebrew, and it tells us... Um, this. So I'm going to go to chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. And this is where we find out a little bit different version of the story than the Cecil B. DeMille or the musical taught us. And it says this, verse 11, chapter 2. And it came to pass that in those days when Moses was grown, and he went out among his brethren and looked on their burdens, and he spot, spied an Egyptian smiting a Hebrew, one of his brethren. And he looked this way and that way. And when he saw that there was no man, he slew the Egyptian, and he hid him in the sand. Uh, so this pivotal event, uh, clearly he knew they were his brethren. He knew he was Hebrew. And so even though he's raised in the Egyptian household, um, we see that he realizes that his people are being oppressed and uh, beaten. And so he, it isn't just a moment of rage, right? He looks this way, and he looks that way, and he kills him and he buries him. So you're like, ooh, Moses. Um, I want to point out here that an interesting part of his story, you say, well, it's justified he was killing someone. It might be. But I think one of the points of the story that I wanted to highlight is that Moses tries here to be a deliverer, a savior of sorts of his people um, on his own. So he's doing it on his own. And later we're going to see where he does it with the help of the Lord. And with the help of the Lord, he's able to save not just one Egyptian, or I'm sorry, one Hebrew um, from being beaten, but he saves all of them. So we see kind of a, uh, a foreshadowing of sorts, but also a learning for Moses that Moses, when you try to do things on your own, um, they may not work out exactly well. But if you trust in the Lord, uh, he will make a way for it to be far greater and far more redemption and salvation than you could ever imagine. Now, an interesting thing happens in the story in the next few verses. Uh, the next day, he's going out and he, these two uh, Hebrews are arguing. They're fighting, it says. And, um, and th he said, what, what's going on with you two? Like, why'd you hit that guy? And they gave him, they give him a hard time. They're like, well, who made you? Uh, prince and judge over us and are you going to kill us too like you did the Egyptian and then Moses realizes something if they know it's known so he runs for his life and he's actually condemned um, so uh, Pharaoh finds out and condemns him for killing the Egyptian I want to point out another thing though besides this is that how the Israelites responded to him they're not super pleased with him. You'll notice as he breaks up this fight that isn't about him at all, they throw it back in his face. And we're going to see this exact questioning of him go throughout the next few uh, chapters, uh, books of the Bible, in fact, is this, are you our judge? Are you the king of us? Uh, yes, he's going to be their prophet and their leader, but they're going to struggle with it. So we see even here the grounds for this. It's hard sometimes to listen to the prophet. It's hard uh, to be led sometimes. And so we're going to see this foreshadowing of not only um, him becoming a, a deliverer um, under the Lord, but we also see the people struggling to understand that role. And here we are in chapter two, it's already happening. Ah. So anyway, so uh, so Moses, we pick up the story again. Moses is uh, banished, basically. He Well, he's they're going to slay him, so he flees. And he heads out to uh, Midian. Now, Midian is uh, a ways away, and he has family relation there. It might be hundreds of years later, but he probably knew about that. So he heads out there, and he heads out to a well in Midian. And that's where the next exciting story of how he meets his wife. So as and women are always at these wells, and we can talk about that uh, on another day. But um, one of the things you should know is that uh, gathering water is usually a woman's task in these days. And so they would go out in the morning or in the evening, and then they would uncover the well, and then you would dip down your bucket or your um, uh, whatever container you had, and then you haul it up really heavy, and then you would have to water your animals or yourself. And so it's really hard work. So um, Jethro, uh, he's also called Beth uh, Ruel in this, um, is there. It's going to be his father-in-law, 
spoiler alert. And um, but these are his daughters. So he's got a whole bunch of daughters and Zipporah is the oldest. And when he gets there to this well, uh, someone is trying to take advantage of them. Right. So someone is um, threatening them and their flocks and Moses steps in. So something to remember about Moses. What does this tell us about his character? Uh, I mean, we originally heard that he, uh, in this earlier in this chapter, he had defended one of the Israelites, the Hebrews, from being beaten um, by a slave master. And here he is not put off by being a defender and being brave, but he wades right in to this story. So you gotta love Moses right out of the gate. He's a guy that is about justice and protection, and um, and he does it here as well. And so that's how he meets the family of Jethro, and then. Um, um, the girls go home and they're like, You'll not, the, the dad's like, what are you doing here? It's it's too early in the day. And they're like, well, this crazy thing happened. And he's like, well, where's that guy? You got to bring him home so he can have dinner with us. And the story progresses. And then he ends up marrying uh, Zipporah. So now we've got a few of Moses's most important um, stories, how all this happened. First, he, we read about his birth story being this miracle, um, which we're gonna see paralleled again with uh, Jesus, right? With the murder of the innocents. Um, and then we see about how he meets his wife and how he uh, grows up in Egypt, but flees and lives in Midian. So, so now we've met that story. So we've got all this great setting. We know he's one that, um, had a great upbringing, has a family that loves him, a Hebrew family, also grew up in an Egyptian household. We see that he is uh, running for his life because of uh, his, maybe his rash behavior or um, trying to defend someone. Um, and then he's noble and brave, he continues to be, and he does the same thing again for his, what would be his future wife. So a great setting to the life of Moses. All right, let's continue on to chapter three. So there's a lot of plot in these stories, so it makes for a great story, does it? I mean, there's just a lot going on. Um, at one point, Moses uh, uh, they decides, hey, we've got to take these flocks. He's a shepherd, and he's been growing up for, for a number of years still here in Midian. So his whole kind of second life happens, right? The first life in Egypt and the second phase, he's growing up in Midian, learning about God, uh, learning to be a shepherd. Now, a shepherd is a very um, outdoorsy kind of job. And so you have to move the flocks from place to place so that they can eat the um, bushes or whatever. I don't even know what, whatever things they eat. So you have to move them around. So he um, takes them up and he says, we're going to go up to this mountain of God. And so, um, so he takes them out and that's where we meet this next amazing story. Now, chapter three of Exodus has more of this really critical part of Moses's life. And we call this um, a vision or an endowment or in uh, the nerd word is a theophany, which means a vision of God. And so this is when he's going to receive this vision and also his calling as a prophet and a deliverer of the people. And later he's going to become their lawgiver. So, so here we are. He's now becoming the shepherd of not only the sheep and goats that he's taking care of, the flocks, but he is going to become a shepherd and a guardian of his people. So he comes to this mountain. He's taking the sheep and um, he comes to the mountain. And then it's this really amazing story. He gets up on the mountain and he sees a bush. Um, the bush is called a Sinai. So it's probably where we get the word Sinai for the Mount Sinai is for the Hebrew name for bush. And so it's a little shrub, which means it's not very tall tree or anything, but it seems to be on fire. And it says in uh, chapter two, and the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked and behold, the bush burned with fire and the bush was not consumed. Um, I want to teach you one other trick in uh, Hebrew literature, and that's the word behold. Uh, the word behold um, is kind of like a pointer. So it's going to point the direction of the, of the text to draw your attention to something else. So at this point, it was like the Lord appeared to him in a flame. And you're like, wow, the Lord is there. And he's like, behold, the bush didn't burn. So it's drawing our attention. So as you read through these, watch for the beholds. Um, they are pointers to draw our attention to something else in the story. So it's a, a way for the story to be a pointer. Behold. 
look that way. So in this case, you see this, he's looking at this angel of the Lord, also called the Lord here. So he sees a vision of the Lord himself, and it's in the burning bush, the Sine that we talked about. Now, something else that's, that I want to draw attention to is you're going to see the same theme um, somewhere else in scripture. So think about a place where you have heard about an angel in a bush that looked like it was burning. Hmm. Yeah, right. In Eden, we see the story of a tree, right? A tree of knowledge. And it seems to be uh, the cherubim with the flaming sword. And so we're, we're recalling this idea of the tree of life, this tree, this place where God is going to be in Eden um, here on this mountain. So the idea of a bush with fire and the Lord are going to bring those same elements together. So the idea of a tree, a bush, um, burning the Lord, we're like, oh, so we're returning in a way to Eden. We're returning to the Lord's presence. So here in chapter three, and it was in again, verse two, we see that we're introduced to the main character of the story of the Lord. And so he's there. Now, something that's really fascinating is it's light and fire, but the tree or the bush isn't burning. It reminds me much of the story of Joseph Smith in the first vision. He says that the light was so white and so powerfully strong um, that he was surprised that the trees and bushes weren't on fire. So this light, this presence um, gives off this light. Uh, also, when we saw Abraham pass through in his covenant in that chapter 12, 13 section of Genesis, remember they do this covenant ceremony where they put the animal and split the animals and then they walk through and the Lord comes through kind of with a torch. So you're going to see the Lord often, um, they're not able to see all of him or they see uh, the elements of fire. So you're going to see that. Again, you're going to see also throughout Exodus where they follow the pillar of fire. Uh, so the the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. And so this idea of the Lord. So they're not able to always see him completely uh, because of his glory and awesomeness, but they can at least see um, the, the fire. And so here we see this kind of the same idea. So the fire, this light, this brilliance, this glory is there. So the Lord even points out, hey, see the bush? It isn't even burnt. And the Lord says, yep. And uh, he calls him Moses. Moses. And Moses says, here I am. Um, if you call someone in uh, Hebrew, you call the name twice, it's endearing. It's how you call to someone who's your close friend or someone that's very dear to you. So I love this in this story. It isn't just Moses, but it's Moses, Moses. This is someone that knows him and he knows as well. So while we have this vision, this first vision of the Lord, we also see that they knew each other. And I, I would assume that, you know, through prayer and other revelation that, that Moses has drawn close to the Lord. And so he's prepared for this. But I love this. So often you see where they're like, be not afraid, right? Because it's this amazing experience to see him. But here we also see this endearing how close he is. Um, and we're going to see the first time he actually calls him his son And scripture is here um, coming up in a bit. But we see this Moses, Moses, and Moses answers, here I am. Um, and then he gives him this important information. Hey, don't get any closer, uh, but take off your shoes because this ground you're standing on is holy. Uh, removing one's shoes and putting them back on uh, usually shows that the person you're with in ancient cultures, and this ancient culture at least, is showing that there's someone above you and there's respect. So you're also entering into a new role and you're changing your shoes and to enter into their presence. So his shoes are also probably filthy. And so you're not going to bring that uh, filth into the Lord, right? He's been uh, shepherding after all. And so it reminds us that we need to cleanse ourselves um, the way that we uh, approach him in humility. And he says that's um, part of it here. So we see that introduction of that uh, changing your shoes or removing your shoes here. We also see that the place is holy. So we're going to learn a lot about holiness um, and the Lord is holy. And so we can't abide. Uh, we cannot abide certain things in his presence that are unholy. So we see that starting here. Now, the Lord introduces himself in this theophany and this vision. And this is a very standard um, uh, structure, by the way, is that the person has got, the Lord introduces himself and he says, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Mo Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. Um, 
you're going to see a lot of this humility and awesome how awesome God is. I love what we learned a few weeks ago when Jacob sees the Lord um, in Genesis 28 when he says, um, he said that was awesome um, and he fears, fearsome, and it, meaning like I'm overwhelmed uh, with the glory and awesomeness. And so he sees that. He says, he, in, the Lord introduces him and he reestablishes how he knows him right through the covenant of Abraham the reestablishment of the covenant with Isaac, the reestablishment of the covenant with Jacob. This is the same one. And then he also, the Lord also um, kind of was revealing himself. And so Moses hid his face. So he is like, I know who this is. And it's um, it's awe-inspiring. It's, uh, humi- it's humbling. We also see this humility. You're going to see it repeated numerous times. So I'll pull it out in a second. But um, this idea that we're going to identify, but he, Moses is going to say, but I'm, I'm not worthy over and over again, but I'm slow of speech, but I, I'm just a guy. I just, and, and that's a very uh, common way um, for Moses to, or anyone, you're going to see it throughout the Old Testament, be kind of self-deprecating and show humility. Um, uh, well, we'll just talk about it now. There's a verse that we usually say he was slow of speech, like he had a stutter or something, and that's why he has Aaron talk for him. But Moses speaks all the time in these places, and we never see him stuttering. And he seems to give lots of speeches. The whole book of Deuteronomy is like five speeches, and he gives them. And so we see Moses speaking all the time. I think what's happening here instead is that self-deprecating, that his true humility that he's showing to the Lord. I, I am... I, 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 you'll see um, others say, like Isaiah, I am a man of unclean lips. Um, so they, they're like, I'm, I'm not worthy to be in your presence. And so we see that here. He's afraid to look upon him. Now the Lord reveals his intention. And he says, um, verse 7, and I'm still in chapter 3. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people, which are in Egypt, and I have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. Now, that was something um, at the end of chapter, uh, at the end of the last chapter, where it says that they cried out to the Lord. So they prayed, they prayed for deliverance, and the Lord heard them. And so the Lord is taking action. So he's saying, I've heard their prayers, I've heard their cries. Um, So if you ever doubt that prayer has effect, it does. Here's a very real example of when the people uh, prayed, and the Lord says, I heard them. And so he says, but I hear their cries of affliction, right? Their taskmaster, the slavery. So he tells them, I'm going to come down and deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians. And I'm going to bring them to the land that's good and large and flowing with milk and honey. And it's got other people in them, but we will get rid of all those people. Um, or at least they'll live together for the most part. So he's going to redeem or make good on his promise that he made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob of land, right? We're going to come to the promised land. And that's that idea of milk and honey. So the idea of milk, right? It has so many um, crops and things that there's just animals and milk and, you know, ice cream and cheese and all the deliciousness and honey, that the, it's a um, fertile land. And so there's um, growing plants. And so it's honey and milk is is weird because it's not a phrase that we would say but it's a phrase they say to say it's a very abundant and fertile land and and rich with the bounties of the earth so you're like wow that sounds great and so that's where we would want to live um to support ourselves and, and our families so he's like i'm going to bring you to the land the land of milk and honey the land promised land that i've been promising so he tells him that he also says so the cry of the children of israel has come to me the prayers the cry and i've seen the oppression So he gives them some instructions. So he says, I'm going to send you to Pharaoh and you're going to help me uh, free them out of Egypt. So there's the mission. So there's your mission call, uh, Moses. And then Moses is like, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? We see that self-deprecation again. We see that humility. Who who am I? That's crazy. Um, So you're going to see this over and over. We see about three more times. And so he says, I will be with thee. The Lord says, I will be with thee. Again, that reminds me a lot of the covenant of Jacob. When Jacob at Bethel sees the Lord, he says, I will be with thee. And here he's renewing that. Moses, it's not just you. I will be with thee. What a strong promise it is that the Lord, when he asks us to do things, that we will be with, he will be with us and we can uh, really rest on that promise that he is going to be with us. So we see the, the covenant promises of Genesis come true, right? We've already seen the people being fruitful. We see the land that was just promised. And now we're seeing uh, that the Lord is going to be with us, just like Jacob's promise. 
And so he says, and this is just going to be a token um, that I have that I have sent thee, that all the people will come out of Egypt and you will serve upon this mountain. So they're all going to have this opportunity to have the same experience you're having right here, right now on this mountain. All the people will come here and that's going to be the sign. So that's the whole story that we're going to be reading. Not only are they going to, the Lord's going to free them, but he's going to bring them back up to this mountain. Um, likewise, we are called to meet the Lord at his mountain, at that mountain of the house of the Lord. And he's calling us back to meet with him and renew those covenants and see him as he is and be with him. So he's calling us as well. So here's the, it says, this is the token that um, that he's giving. This is the sign that everyone's going to come to the, the temple, to the mountain, to Sinai. Um, he says, how, uh, when I go and tell them, what name should I tell them? And then we have this great verse in verse 14. He says, and God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And and he says, thus, shall, thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. Now a lot have been, has been made of this phrase, that it is the great I am. We're going to see Jesus using this phrase later, right? It's a uh, uh, I, I am that I am. And um, and we're saying he's the one that is. He's the one that creates. And he says, that's what I want to say to them. And um, and then God says also to Moses that you shall say the Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob has sent me. And this is my name forever. And this is a memorial to all generations. And so we learn that this is the, uh, the reestablishment here of the name of Jehovah, the covenant name of Lord. Now, this name is, this isn't the first time we hear this name. It's reestablished um, for the people. Uh, we read about it in Genesis. So maybe they've forgotten. But I think what it's telling us is that the Lord is covenanting again with the people and we're covenanting right with the Lord. So um, that's where we get the name uh, Yahweh or Jehovah is the other way to say that. And so he's saying, I am that I am. So he says, so go go tell them it's me. It's the one that you're covenanting with and go all the way back and go get all those people. So in verse 18, he goes, go get all the uh, um, the Israelites and get their elders, their leaders, and tell them what's happening. And then they will listen to you. And um, and so then, uh, and, and they're all going to move out. It's going to be great. And that's where he also starts to give him some signs. So in chapter four, uh, moving on, he gives them three different signs that he's supposed to do. So Moses says, hey, how are people, including the Israelites, supposed to know? So he says, well, first give them my name. Um, but then I want you to do three things. So he tells them three miracles they're supposed to do. And the first is he has a staff. And I said, you throw it down and then it will become a snake. And I love this because he throws it down and it's a snake. And so Moses runs away. No, no, grab it. So grabs the end and it becomes a staff again. He, uh, Moses is going to use this uh, to show the people and also the um, magicians and, and people of Egypt uh, in Pharaoh's court. So he's going to show them the same thing. So throw down a staff. Now you're going to see this staff throughout the rest of the story. You're also going to see staff used as something certainly almost all men of the day tended to carry. So um, it even talks about how they probably carved it with their names and it became kind of an item that was recognized with them. So the staff becomes important. Now, Aaron's staff, Aaron, his brother, we're going to meet him again in a second, is going to also have a staff and his staff is going to bloom with with uh, the almond branch kind of raised blossoms. And so that is going to be placed in the Ark of the Covenant where they carry around the uh, Ten Commandments again. So these staffs become these signs. Are these, uh, Moses is going to reach forth his staff, right? And the sea's going to, but he's going to hit the rock with his staff and it's going to, uh, water's going to burst forth. So you're going to see this staff being used. It's kind of an extension of the man. Is the staff magic? Does it have properties by itself? No, it doesn't. Um, but we do see it's kind of an extension of Moses. So, so we see this staff. Um, being gone. So that's the first one. Uh, the second sign is he takes his hand. He says, put your hand inside your, your shirt. And when he pulls it out, it's leprous. Now there are a number of skin diseases that were particularly terrible in those times. And so it would look like it was dying. And so he pulls his hand out. Ah, and then he says, don't put it back in. So he puts it back in and it's healed. Now, when you go to Moses's court, uh, Pharaoh's court, you don't see Moses 
using this, but um, but he's got that one. So we think he probably is showing this one to the Israelites, right? He's also showing it to his people saying, hey, I'm really called. So he does the staff, he does the hand, and then he does the third one, which is um, he can change water into blood. So while the snake and the staff go back and forth, you know, returns to being a staff and the hand returns to being real, the blood becomes blood. And so we're going to see that happen um, in these these plagues of Egypt that are coming up. So he gives them those tokens, those signs, so that when he, when Moses goes to his people and to Pharaoh, he knows. Now, again, when you go to those stories, notice that he doesn't do the hand one, at least it doesn't show us doing that, but he's given those. So in chapter four, we learn a little bit about those. Um, and then here's the this uh, verse 10 of chapter four. Again, we see this humility of, of Moses, um, where after he receives these three signs, um, Moses is like, oh, Lord, I'm not eloquent. Uh, I'm slow of speech and uh, slow of tongue. And then he tells him, well, who made you, right? I can do all those things. Um, and that's where he kind of says, um, no, like I won't go. Um, and the Lord's kind of mad at him, like, come on, man. My interpretation there, he says, no, Moses, I will, fine, I will, um, isn't this Aaron coming? And so you're like, Aaron just shows up on the scene, so he must be called as well. So Aaron shows up on the mountain, and he says, isn't that your brother? You know, Aaron's three years older. Wait a minute. We've heard a lot about brothers and siblings, and so far in the story, do they get along very well? Not typically. So the thing we should be worried about is, oh no, how is the older brother going to respond to the younger brother? And Aaron is such a great uh, example of someone who shows humility and just always um, follows Moses. So even though he is the older brother, Moses um, is the true brother of of his uh, of the prophet and and follows him and is a supporter throughout his life. So we we should say no no a brother story, but this one works out. So much praise to Aaron. And so Aaron. Um, Lord says, isn't this Aaron, the Levite, coming up the hill? And he's like, yeah, he is. And so he says, well, he can be your spokesperson. So Aaron becomes the spokesperson. We also see Aaron then becoming uh, the first priest. So we see there's prophet, and then Aaron's going to be the high priest and, and his family. And so we see this assignment of speaking for and behalf of the other people come here. Uh, this is the first time we really see this assignment in Aaron. So Aaron's given that right here in chapter so the Lord says, well, I will make him your spokesperson. So he'll, I'll speak to you and you speak to him. And that's what we'll do. So that's his role. Uh, they all head back to Jethro, right? After this amazing vision. And, um, and so Moses says, guess, you know, kind of crazy. This thing happened. And um, so he, you better go, you know? So uh, it says immediately that Moses packs up his family, his two sons, and packs up his wife and off they go to Egypt. So like, how is this all going to work out? So at the end of chapter four, at the end of chapter four, there's also this um, strange story. So you'll, I want you to go to the Joseph Smith translation of Exodus four, uh, excuse me, 24 through 27, because you're going to see actually the wording is missing. Some, it doesn't even make sense very well. But um, as they were traveling, uh, the Lord comes to Moses and says he was angry with Moses because he hadn't circumcised his son. And so Zipporah, now once again, these women have this great role of jumping in. And so she jumps in and she circumcises her son. Um, so she takes care of that important sign and of the, of the covenant. And it says, um, Moses was ashamed. Uh, this is verse 26 of the JST in chapter 4. Moses was ashamed and he hid his face from the Lord and said, I have sinned before the Lord. And the Lord said unto Aaron, go into the wilderness and meet Moses. And they went and then he appeared before him. So this, this odd little story about, um, of Zipporah. So I think it's important to remember that this, this, these are about families helping each other and, uh, and they had not uh, shown the sign of the covenant, um, to, with the son. So, so supports a care of it. So I love that. She's very Rebecca, like just jumping in, but make sure you read the JST on that one. Otherwise you're like, what is going on? Um, but these are normal people and they are learning, uh, to walk in the covenant path. And so you see where Moses had forgotten that step. And so Zipporah takes care of it. All right. Chapter five. All right. So now they've met Aaron. And so again, and so they said, go 
with Aaron and then go and tell Pharaoh the news. And what they tell him is, let my people go that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. Now this feast is uh, a sacrifice. This is uh, not just a party um, in the wilderness or a festival of sorts, but it's a holy day uh, to let my people go and so that they may worship me. And again, this is where we finally see the face off. So we've set the people, we've met Pharaoh with no name other than his title. We've met Moses and Aaron now as the leaders of the people and endowed by God to go ahead and free the people. And they finally meet Pharaoh. Now, it's interesting to note that they don't meet with like an underling or the Pharaoh vice president or some ambassador, but they go right to the top. So this is really a face off God and Pharaoh, right? And who will win. So they tell him, hey, uh, the Lord has sent me and uh, let my people go. As an aside, I had to do a Hebrew final and the, you never knew what they were going to put in the final that you had to translate. And one of the phrases was these, let my people go was right there. I had to translate that. Luckily, that was an easy one. I didn't always get them in Hebrew, but I got let my people go. Um, okay. So um, Pharaoh says like, who's the Lord? Who's this guy, right? Who's your God that I have to obey him? I don't know your God. And so I will not let them go. So we see Pharaoh really uh, doubling down. You're going to see this over and over again. It's going to say Pharaoh hardened his heart or uh, the Lord hardened his heart. But we're going to see that Pharaoh is absolutely unrelenting in his evil. And so he is going to do, no matter what happens, um, he is just doubling down on his evil and will not relent we even see that some of his advisors are like, he's crazy. Like at some point, even they are like, this is too much. And so I want you to notice that Pharaoh is this very epitome of evil, where no matter what, nothing will soften, nothing will change his mind. It doesn't matter. Even after all the signs, right? And the um, plagues, he keeps going after them. So he's, he's, uh, he's not someone who is going to follow the Lord. Um, so uh, they say, hey, let my people go so they can come and worship me. And in chapter five, verse four, it says the king of Egypt says, well, wherefore do ye, Moses and Aaron, let the people go from their works? Like who's going to do their work? Get you unto their burdens. Like who's going to do all their slavery jobs if I let them go? Um, he goes, so uh, if there's so many of them and you're just going to let them take a break? And he says, all right, well, make it even harder. So now there's no more straw to make the bricks that they're making. Um, now they have to do it. They have to gather straw or scrabble themselves to make the bricks, which help the, the uh, drying of it. So they have to work even harder. So what's Pharaoh doing? He's turning the people against Moses and Aaron. He's making their job harder. Also, we should remember the other time we have heard about uh, people making things with bricks, and that is the Tower of Babel or Babylon, that they're going to create something. So it recalls to us this battle of kind of good versus evil, Zion versus Babylon. And here we're going to see it with Pharaoh versus the Lord. So this idea of uh, the creating of these cities, right, to, to glorify themselves. And so we see the bricks again referenced. So all these little hyperlinks to the other stories, since we just read them, probably come to mind, but there you go. Um, so Pharaoh makes it harder. He sets the people against uh, the Lord. He sets the, or tries to, and he tries to set them against Moses and Aaron. I'll make their jobs even harder. So he doesn't give them straw, but they still have to do their quotas. So they're pretty mad. They're pretty upset, pretty tough. And so it's just going to get harder for here. Um, keep going and let's go on to the next, the last chapter we want to review today. Now, in chapter six, um, we're going to see, again, um, the Lord reminding Pharaoh that, or, or uh, Moses that all these things that I'm doing, I'm going to send you. So let's read six, chap uh, chapter six, verse one. And the Lord said unto Moses, now shalt thou see what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand shall he let them go, and with a strong hand he shall drive them out of this land. And God spake unto Moses and said unto him, I am the Lord. And I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto J Jacob by the name of God Almighty, but by my name Jehovah was I not known to them. But if you see in the uh, Joseph Smith translation, uh, he says, my, and was my name not known to them. It, it was. You can go back in Genesis. It was. So that, that is a better translation. So you'll see that the Lord is saying, I am the Lord, and 
as tough as Pharaoh's going to be, I'm still with you. And what a reassuring message. How many times in your life have you said, I'm really experiencing something tough, something challenging. And here we see that the Lord is still with us. And the Lord is stronger than all of those forces are arrayed against us. But the Lord is reminding us. He's also reminding us of the covenant. The covenant that he made anciently with um, Moses' fathers, right? Abraham, Isaac, Joseph. Uh, Jacob, our fathers, right, with our family, saying, I will remember you. It's an interesting phrase, and I want you to watch for it, too. You're going to see here, you're going to see in a couple different places when the Lord says, and the Lord remembered them, or the Lord heard their cries. The Lord is not just hearing them in prayer, but he's remembering the covenants that they made, because the Lord doesn't forget things. So it's, it's what it's telling us is the Lord recalled the covenant that he had made. So those covenants that he makes with us binds us to him and and uh, and he hears us, he remembers that. And he's recalling that promise. He's saying, I promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and so I am coming to redeem you as well. So when we have tough times, remember he is with us. Remember that he remembers his promises and he keeps his covenants. And here's a perfect example. He also has reminded them that he knows them and we know his name, his covenant name, uh, Jehovah. Uh, and then he reminds them, I established a covenant, right? And so, yep, exactly. And then I remember. There's this little section in verse 6, 7, and 8. I'm in Exodus 6. Let's read that really quickly. It says this. I want you to watch how it begins and how it ends because the Lord's going to tell us something really interesting about himself. He says this, Exodus 6, 6 through 8. Wherefore, say unto the children of Israel, I am the Lord. And I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will rid you out of their bondage, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm, with a stretched out arm, and with great judgments. And I will take you to me for a people, and I will be to you a God. And ye shall know that I am the Lord your God, which bringeth you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will bring you into in unto the land concerning which I did swear to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, and I will give it to you for an heritage. I am the Lord. Notice how he starts this, I am the Lord, and ends, I am the Lord. It's what we call an inclusio. It's kind of an bookend or an envelope kind of structure to take everything in the middle um, and kind of wrap it around so we really highlight it. So it's a great idea to highlight six through eight and say the Lord is making promises. He's saying, I am the Lord. I'm the one who keeps my covenant. And I'm going to remember that what I'm going to do is going to save you. And I'm going to redeem you. And I'm going to be your God. And I'm going to save you from the Egyptians. And I'm going to give you that land that I promised um, to the covenant fathers. And so I am the Lord. I am going to do it. Um, I love this scripture because he reminds us who he is and what his promises are and what his covenants are. Powerful. So that's an inclusio, and the Lord is highlighting that for us. Um, In case you hear it, read it out loud again. I am the Lord. The promises, I am the Lord. Powerful. All right, almost done. So, um, So Moses goes back out to the children of Israel, and they're pretty upset after this first, um, you know, the brick thing, and now we can't have the straw, and it's just getting worse. And so they're struggling with this too. And he reminds them, saying um, that the promises of the Lord. And so he is going out to the people and, and reminding them, and then he ends up going back to Pharaoh. So he goes back to Pharaoh and um, tells them, okay, this is like a bunch of genealogy here. And then he's telling them who he is and what's going to happen. So um, the story is going to continue. Now, number six ends um, with the Lord reminding his people who they are and setting them up against Pharaoh, right? That um, that Pharaoh isn't going to listen uh, to them. So we're setting up the big battle of the plagues so at this point we've got all of our characters we've learned about moses being chosen from birth we've we've learned about um all these women who have helped uh, in deliverance and sacrifice from the uh, midwives to his mother and his sister and even the princess we've learned also from um that moses and aaron the brothers are going together and the lord has called them from the mountain and reminded them of their covenants and he is going with them to save the people and bring them to the mountain and make a covenant with them 
Uh, brothers and sisters, I'm grateful for the story of Moses. I'm grateful for the deliverance and the promises of the Savior that he remembers us and he walks with us. And I am grateful that we have a chance to study them together. So go ahead and if you have any questions or comments, put them down in the comments below. Tell me uh, what questions or things you see about the covenants that are made here with Moses and the redemption of his people and how it relates to you and the redemption in your life. Um, my testimony is that you will love Moses and the story of how he reflects the Savior in our lives. And I say that in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Don't forget to make some comments, uh, like, and subscribe, all that. And uh, let me know uh, any questions you have. And we'll see you next time. The people behind the stories in the Old Testament were not always the heroes we now see them to be. They were real people with real struggles. They were sinners, failures, and doubters. But they were also conduits for miracles and wonders. The heroes are the people who failed, struggled, and were imperfect, and yet have the strength to return to God. Wrapping together history, language, culture, and motifs, author Lori Denning brings light and deeper interpretation to the Old Testament stories we already know so well. With these powerful examinations of Abraham, Miriam, Gideon, Ruth, and more, you will come to know the real men and women behind the pages their mistakes, their failings, and their triumphs. Recognize the Lord in every story as He works to make these imperfect people better. Understand that we can also succeed in Christ, no matter our present doubts or imperfections. Just like the men and women whose stories are recorded in Scripture, we, too, can become instruments in the Lord's hand and be heroes of our own lives. All it takes is putting our trust and our faith in God.